In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome to our study of the book of Sirach, also known as Ben Sirah, and also known as Ecclesiasticus. And so this is a book that actually has three names. And when you look at certain Bibles, depending on how old they are or where they're from, you might find different names. So first and foremost, uh, the name in Hebrew is Ben Sir. I've got the Hebrew right over here on the text. And if you do research and if you're looking online, you might find information about Ben Sir. It's all talking about the same book. Um, if you go to a Catholic Bible or to an Orthodox Bible, you're probably going to find the name uh, Sirach. Or if you're looking at an older Bible, like the Dewey Reims uh, translation, you might find the name Ecclesiasticus from the Latin. Uh, it has a sense of church book. Um, and so if you really love to go through scripture and you want to study the Bible and especially walk through each chapter, this is the channel for you. Please like and subscribe. So we're going to look at Ben Sirah. We're going to go through a little introduction and talk about the background and some amazing things about the book of Ben Sirah. The first amazing thing to note is that for many generations, we did not have Hebrew manuscripts of the book of Ben Sirah. So we had manuscripts that were in Greek and in Latin and other languages. And we had writings that talked about the Hebrew manuscripts, but many people doubted that they existed. However, in about 1896, we began to discover the Hebrew manuscripts of the book of Sirach or Ben Sirah. So a couple of things about the history of the book are important to know. First and foremost, the book was composed by a man named Jesus Ben Sirah, right around 200 to 180 BC, most likely around Jerusalem. And so it was originally written in Hebrew. And then if you read the prologue, we're going to go through just the beginning of the prologue. If you read the prologue, his grandson, translated the book into Greek. This is really exciting because it gives scholars an idea of how books were even translated in the ancient world. And so in 132 BC, probably around the city of Alexandria, Egypt, where the greatest library in the world was, the book was translated into Greek by the grandson of Jesus ben Sirah, Yeshua ben Sirah. And so he never tells us his name, but it's really amazing to consider. So first it's written in Hebrew, then it's translated into Greek two generations later by an unnamed grandson of Jesus ben Sirah. So just a little bit of review that the book of ben Sirah is considered to be among the seven deuterocanonical books. So if you look at the Catholic Bible, it has 73 books in the canon. And so you have the Pentateuch, otherwise known as the Torah, or the law, that's the first five books of the Bible. Then you have 16 historical books. And notice that I have the deuterocanonical books uh, here and they are highlighted and also in italics. And so among those historical books, you have Tobit, Judith, and first and second Maccabees. Those are among the deuterocanonical books accepted as canonical by the Roman Catholic Church and also Orthodox churches, the majority of Christianity, and also historically Christianity has accepted them as canonical. You can go back and you can look at some of the early councils where these books were accepted. Uh, and I don't have it on this video, but I'll try to include it on future videos where we talk about some of those early councils and how they accepted these books as canonical in the early church in the 300s and 400s. Very important to read and understand. And so also among the prophets, you have 18 books. Baruch is one of the deuterocanonical books. And so lastly, there are some additions to the book of Esther and Daniel. And so you basically have a longer version in the Greek Septuagint translation. That Septuagint translation is often abbreviated LXX, the Roman numeral, Roman number for 70. Um, and so it's not extra large. We're not talking about an extra large T-shirt here. It's the Septuagint translation. This was all done before the coming of Christ. Very important to note. So... We're going to look at the prologue to Ben Sirah. 
or the book of Sirach. I'm reading from the RSVCE, the Revised Standard Version Catholic uh, Edition. Uh, and so uh, let's just take a look right here very quickly. We've got a typo that we have to fix right there. It says, whereas many great teachings have been given to us through the law and the prophets and the others that followed them, on account of which we should praise Israel for instruction and wisdom. Now, this is being written by the grandson of Jesus ben Sirah a couple generations later, right around the year 132 BC. And what's really important is to notice how he makes a distinction between the law, that's the first five books of the Bible, and then the prophets, okay? And so for Jews, the prophets could actually go from Joshua forward. Um, and that's a whole nother class as well. There's different ways of talking about the law and the prophets between Christians and Jews. But what I want to point out here is notice the distinct divisions that are here. The law, the prophets, and the others that followed them. And he goes on and he says this, that, that on account of which we should praise Israel for instruction and wisdom. So wisdom is drawn from these writings. And he goes on and he says, since it is necessary not only that the readers themselves should acquire understanding, but also that those who love learning should be able to help the outsiders by both speaking and writing. My grandfather, Jesus, after devoting himself especially to the reading of the law and the prophets and the other books of our fathers, and after acquiring considerable proficiency in them, was himself also led to write something pertaining to the instruction and wisdom in which that, by becoming conversant with this also, those who love learning should make even greater progress in living according to the law. So basically what he's getting at is that, you know, these this book, Ben Sirah, or Sirach, is actually going to help us grow in wisdom and really live according to really live according to the law or the Torah. And so now let's consider some special um, considerations. Let's look at the prologue here. I'm going to break it down and just talk about a couple points. First and foremost, we know that the name of the author is Jesus Ben Ben Sirah, Yeshua Ben Sirah. Okay, and that his grandson is writing the prologue around 132 BC, two generations after the Hebrew version. And what's also interesting, as I mentioned, is the, the distinct divisions between the law, the prophecies, and other books of the Hebrew Bible. That's very important because even to this day, Jews will talk about the law, the prophets, and the writings, okay? So this is not as clear, but you can at least see this concept developing. That's the point that I want to make. And you can also find a very similar distinction if you go to Luke 24. You read the scene on the road to Emmaus, and it talks about the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. That's in Luke 24. And so going on, the prologue is of great value to biblical scholars because it tells us that many of these books, the law, the prophets, and other writings were already being translated into Greek. This is really important because you see that this is the very first translation, the Septuagint, abbreviated LXX. It's the first translation of the Bible. And so for scholars, we can look at the prologue to Ben Sira and say, wow, this is amazing because we see that most of the books were already translated around this time, 132 BC. That's 132 years before the birth of Christ. This means that Jews all around the Mediterranean world were able to read the scriptures in Greek, and even Gentiles could have access to these writings. So the seeds are being planted all around the Mediterranean world. And so the, the value here is that Greek at this time, it was the lingua franca. It was the language of trade and business and government. And, and it was important if you wanted to, you know, move up in the world to know Greek. So the, the scriptures are available in this language. It's very similar to English today where people from other countries want to learn English so that they can really you know, communicate with others from other countries as well. English is kind of like the lingua franca today. 
so Jews were in what was called the diaspora. The diaspora means that they were scattered throughout the, the Greco-Roman world. And so all these Jews who were scattered among the nations could now read the scriptures in Greek. They were now accessible outside of Hebrew. Uh, and so Ben Sir is underlining this a very important point. So what happened? For many years, we did, actually did not have Hebrew versions. We had Greek, Latin, and other versions of Ben Sir. And then something amazing happened in 1896 in Cairo, in the Cairo Ganesa, a place where old manuscripts were stored there were a couple women who were visiting Egypt and they came, they, you know, were able to purchase some of these old manuscripts. They brought them back to England. They showed them to a scholar of the Hebrew language. And he started reading these and go, and he said, Whoa, this is Ben Sira. This is, this is the Ben Sira that we've heard about who was written in Hebrew. So basically, can you just imagine this scholar reading a manuscript from the book of Sirach or Ben Sira? and saying, wow, we've heard about the Hebrew manuscripts and now we have them. This is absolutely amazing to think about. And so um, you, I can just imagine what the scholar, I wish I was a fly on the wall when he was reading this manuscript from Ben Sira and could have just you know, seen this guy marveling at this. So they found a total of six different manuscripts. They probably date from the Middle Ages, maybe around 1200 or so. And so it doesn't go all the way back to the time of Christ or Ben Sira, but you can see that there was a manuscript tradition. There was a tradition of, of, trans, of I guess you could say, um, passing on these sacred texts. So they're often referred to as manuscripts A through F, but then they found some older manuscripts. They found smaller versions, smaller parts of manuscripts in Masada, which does come from about the time of Christ, and also Qumran. Qumran, that's also known as the Dead Sea Scrolls. And these are caves that are in the Judean desert where they found many ancient manuscripts, which could even be before the time of the birth of Christ, or just after the birth of Christ, okay? So if you wanna see more of this, you can go to this website. It's called bensira.org. I've got the link right here on my page. And so you can basically just Google this and find it really very easily. And you can look at some of these ancient manuscripts. The point that I wanna make here is that this is really amazing. The book was actually written originally in Hebrew. Some think that the reason these were uh, taken out of other canons is because they thought that it was originally not written in Hebrew. And so you can see it was, um, but this is really amazing when you, when you see the history of a biblical book. So I wanted to bring this up in the beginning of our talk on Ben Sira. Much, much more could be said. I'm giving you a very brief introduction. So let's look at the structure of the book of Ben Sira. There's not a real uh, elaborate structure. It's actually very simple. A lot of scholars will say that you basically just have 43 chapters on wisdom and the moral life where it really reflects the book of Proverbs, the first 43 chapters. And then when you get to chapters 44 to 51, you have a section which goes through the salvation history of Israel. It's often referred to as the praise of the fathers. And I, I love this section because it gives you a really spiritual view of how they saw history. And so when you read the praise of the fathers, you have to imagine living in what's called the second temple period around 200 BC or 180 BC, and just asking yourself, how did they understand their own history at this time? And so it provides beautiful insights into how one living in the Second Temple period would have understood their history, okay? And there's some beautiful insights in that section. So please read through it. So the background of Ben Sira, he draws a lot from the Pentateuch, that's the law, the Torah, and also the prophets. So he's not just drawing from wisdom literature, but when you read the book of Sirach, Ben Sirah, you want to really understand that he's drawing from you know, the compendium of sacred scripture and underlining the gift of wisdom. He begins chapter one, we're going to go into chapter one, and he says that all wisdom is from the Lord. And, and he talks about the eternal characteristic of wisdom. It's, it's so vast that you just can't, you know, you can't exhaust it. It's like the sand of the sea, the drops of rain, the days of eternity, the heights of heaven. 
Yeah, it's like the width or the breadth of the earth, like the abyss. And in other words, the point that he's trying to make about wisdom is that wisdom comes from God. It comes from the Lord, but it's really impossible to measure it. It's it's inexhaustible. And for that reason, you should be reading scripture, meditating on scripture, praying over the scriptures, considering the significance of the scriptures, because you want to grow in wisdom and you want to put it into practice. So it's more than something to be studied. It is something that has to be put into practice and lived. That's what wisdom is. And so when you go to Ben Sirach uh, chapter one, verse four, or Sirach chapter one, verse four, he says that wisdom was created before all things. He draws from Proverbs chapter eight, especially chapter eight, verse 12, and chapter eight, 22 to 31. And then now uh, in verse 11, he gets into a section that I want to read through. He talks about the fear of the Lord, and he develops a concept that is in Proverbs. If you look at Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, it talks about how the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all knowledge. And so Ben Sirah is going to uh, basically develop this concept. Uh, and so he doesn't change the concept. He develops the concept, a very important distinction, very similar to the development of doctrine, where we say that it is not changed substantially. There is no way that it could be changed substantially. In the same way, Ben Sir, he uses this concept of the fear of the Lord, and he develops this concept without changing it. He complements it, but he helps us to understand how the fear of the Lord delights the heart. It gives joy and long life that those who have the fear of the Lord will be blessed at the moment of death. In other words, um, there's a, a very beautiful understanding of eschatology here. They will be blessed in their death, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It is wisdom's full measure. It is the crown of wisdom. It is the root of wisdom. So let's go to the text right now. If you have your Bible, you can open up to the book of Sirach, and you can go to chapter one, and we're going to go to verse 11, okay? I'm using the RSVCE, the Revised Standard Version Catholic Edition. And here's what it says. The fear of the Lord is glory and exaltation, and gladness and a crown of rejoicing. The fear of the Lord delights the heart and gives gladness and joy and a long life. With him who fears the Lord, it will go well at the end. On the day of his death, he will be blessed. Notice this eschatological view. To fear the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. She is created with the faithful in the womb. She made among men an eternal foundation. And among their descendants, she will be trusted. To fear the Lord is wisdom's full measure. measure. She satisfies men with her fruits. She fills their whole house with desirable goods and their storehouses with her produce. Now, you're, you're probably reading this and going, wait a minute, what about this whole, why is you know, the feminine she be, being used here. Well, number one, the one thing I, I want to bring up here is that, you know, the word chokma is the word for wisdom. It is a feminine word. And then from that, we get the Greek word Sophia. So you can see how wisdom itself, it's, it's a feminine word. Um, but this really goes all the way back to the book of Proverbs. And it uses this image of wisdom and it, and it tells one to seek wisdom. Um, and it gives the image of a young man who seeks to be joined to wisdom. And, and when you go through the book of Proverbs, it begins with this beautiful image of seeking wisdom. This is how you should live your life. And then it finishes with the image of the valiant wife, which is a woman who puts wisdom into action. And so Proverbs begins with this, this, these beautiful feminine images of wisdom, and then it ends with the, with the image of the valiant wife. And then in between Proverbs, when you take this journey through the book of Proverbs, it gives negative feminine images that contrast the positive feminine images. So sometimes you have people who, um, unfortunately, they misunderstand scripture and they say that, you know, scripture has a bad view of women. And I will often tell them, maybe you're not reading scripture correctly because you see that there's positive images that are feminine and negative images. And you have the same thing, masculine images that are negative and also ones that are positive. So please read the sacred text properly. And so 
the book of Ben Sira picks up on this positive feminine image of wisdom and it uses this image to underline how we should seek wisdom. And in the beginning of this is the fear of the Lord. Now, the fear of the Lord is not fear from the Lord. The fear of the Lord is a great reverence for all that is holy and pleasing to God. And so the one who has the fear of the Lord will turn away from sin and they will turn to the Lord. They will turn away from all that is not pleasing to God and they will seek to do all that is pleasing to God. So it's a fear that gives us a great reverence and love for God. Notice what he says. It, he says that, look at my list here. The fear of the Lord delights the heart. It gives joy. It gives long life. You will be blessed at the moment of your death. It is the beginning of wisdom. And so the fear of the Lord is a special phrase that underlines this great reverence and love that I will have for the Lord, and also a great desire to turn away from sin uh, and to turn away from all that is not pleasing to God. So yes, our society needs to rediscover the fear of the Lord so that we could turn away from sin and turn to God. That's what the fear of the Lord helps us to do. And so how beautiful it is that Ben Sira begins with this concept of the fear of the Lord. As I mentioned before, he builds on the concept that is in Proverbs 1.7. And so that's our short introduction to the book of Ben Sira. And I hope to add more chapters gradually onto this playlist of Ben Sira. If you want to look at other biblical books, you can just go to the playlist on this YouTube channel and you can find a playlist for many books in scripture. The goal is to put together a playlist for each book of the Bible so that people can really go through the Bible, know the sacred text, and that they can go out and live the faith and share the faith with others. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.